This is the Digging for Truth podcast, presented by the Associates for Biblical Research, demonstrating the historical reliability of the Bible through archaeological and biblical research. On October 7, 2023, the world was stunned as a surprise terrorist attack was launched on Israel. Today, Israel battled to repel a surprise invasion of its territory after Palestinian militants launched highly coordinated attacks from Gaza. Thousands of rockets were fired into Israel as gunmen infiltrated several border towns and bases, kidnapping civilians and soldiers. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu declared the country was, quote, at war. It's hard not to hear about it, even if you don't follow the news. And people all over seem to be rooting for one side or the other, the Palestinians or the Israelis. And the debate rages on about the West Bank, Gaza, the two-state solution, and stuff like that. And we're not going to talk about any of that today. But one question that we've seen come up is, where are the Palestinians? We know that Israelis, Jews, are the descendants of the ancient Israelites. But where is Palestine, and what's the history of it? And if you think about it, the word Palestine looks a lot like Philistine. Is there any connection of the Palestinians to the ancient Philistines of the Bible? Archaeologist Dr. Gary Byers is here, along with Henry. And so, Gary, to start off with, who were the Philistines, and are the Palestinians named after them? Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe in a, a little bit, we could talk about the history of the Philistines. Yeah, well, that, that's that's great. And it is a really timely uh, topic. So the, the, the word Palestine, we do think comes from the Philistines, and I'd like to talk about that with you in a, in a bit. But, you know, Palestine and Philistines is one thing, but the Palestinian term really wasn't used. They would talk about Palestine in antiquity, but they never talked about Palestinians. Palestine was a general region, and Palestinians, it just wasn't a term that we that we have from antiquity. They were they were Israelites. They were people from other people groups, but they they weren't. Pal- Nobody was called Palestinians, even though they lived in a region called Palestine. So there's a Philistine Palestine connection, not really, and we can talk about it. Not really a a Palestinian, as we say the term today, and Philistine connection. Okay, Very confusing. Yeah, well, a little bit confusing. That didn't answer, but I, you know, we can talk about it for the next hour to kind of clear everything up. Let's do it. So, when we're talking about the the Philistines, where are the origins of the Philistines? Okay, so the Philistines. It's an amazing passage. You guys are familiar with Genesis chapter ten, the 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 table of nations off the boat, off off the ark. Uh, how Noah's three sons divided up into three uh, regions and the family lines that come out of that. And in Genesis chapter 10, talking about the descendants of Ham and Mitzrayim was one of his descendants. And Mitzrayim is the Hebrew name, modern and ancient for Egypt. Okay. So Egypt, uh, father Egypt, father Mitzrayim gave birth to uh, about a, about a half a dozen, about a dozen sons. And um, one of them, his name was Kash, Kash, well, they call the people are called the Kashulites. <laughs> Can't say that right. Kashluhites. And the in Genesis chapter 10, verse uh, 14. And the Kashluhites are understood to be people related to the island of Crete. Hmm. And and in the text, it now doesn't mention Crete in the text, but the biblical text mentions the Kashluhites, and then it says from whom the Philistines came. And the Philistines, you know, don't show up till much later in the Bible story. So this is a, a later addition to, to the, you know, to the fact. But there they are. The Philistines are mentioned connected to Crete. There's three other passages in the Old Testament that connect the Philistines with Crete. So clearly the Philistines are Aegean people from the island of Crete. And um, that's their initial connection initial introduction in the Bible. Then, of course, they, they show up later in, in the book of Genesis in relationship to Abraham, and they're living on the coast. Well, if you are people from Crete, from the Aegean Sea, you probably are going to wind up, when you get to 
Israel to the promised land, to Canaan, to Palestine, you're going to wind up on the coast. And sure enough, that's where we have Abimelech. Ahimelech is the, the king of Philistines, a group. He's the only one ever mentioned as a king of the Philistines. He was there way before the Philistine migration showed up in the days of Joshua and Judges. So way, way, way early, this one guy shows up and he's on the coast, and he's a Philistine. And, and so these are sea people that came from the Aegean world, one of many sea people groups that came not only to the coast of the Levant, the northern and southern Levant, but even to Egypt. So, Gary, these, um, these references in the book of Genesis in Abraham, uh, uh, is it Ahimelech? Ahim- Ahim- Ahimelech, Ahim- yeah. Ahimelech. Abraham makes a treaty with him and there's a couple of places where he's mentioned, but a lot of times people say that these Philistines references in Genesis are anachronisms Yeah, because I think people think about the Philistines of the later period where we have distinct material culture, which you're going to talk about and that kind of thing. So just explore that for our, our listeners a little bit. You know, why would the biblical author use that term? Do you, do you, th- we don't know exactly why, but just give us your thoughts on that. One way to look at it is to say it's anachronistic. But those of us that believe the Bible is authentic, uh, not only history, but message from God, we don't think that that's the case. It has to be literal. And there's just no reason why in the Bronze Age, we know people are sailing all over the Eastern Mediterranean. We, we, We have plenty of evidence for that. So to think that there's somebody that came from the Aegean, and I'm okay that, that we would take them as literally the descendants of these Cashelites on Crete, but it would be okay in my mind if they're just in this, this milieu of, of people coming from that region, that a group of them wind up on the southern Canaan coast, and they've carved out a little kingdom among the Canaanites, and they're doing okay. And I, I just have no problem Uh, Although we don't have any specific evidence to say, well, there was a Philistine group in this place at this time that early. I have no problem that that it's just the most reasonable, understandable way to look at the text. Yeah. You made me think of, uh, so, so the biblical author Moses doesn't make a, a hard distinction between earlier sea peoples and the Philistines as we know them classically. And I just yes. thought, I thought of an analogy uh, in the later period in the, in the conquest narratives, sometimes uh, the Canaanites are broadly referred to all the people in the land. And sometimes they're distinguished Jebusites, Amorites, yes. and so on. So in this case, Moses doesn't distinguish them in the case of the Philistine terminology. That's kind of how I see it as well. Does that make sense? Does that seem reasonable to you? I, I think it, if you believe the Bible, the biblical text is to be true and accurate, then it's just, it's the only logical explanation. Yeah. And we keep digging around. We're going to find some of that kind of evidence. We're going to find it because it's just, it's just logical and makes sense. And so I don't think we have to worry about anachronisms when it comes to this story. Yeah. Yeah. So Crete and the Aegean, is that kind of like the Greece, re- isn't Greece part of the Aegean Sea, like kind of Southern Europe? Yeah, so so the the Aegean is the sea between the east coast of Greece and the west coast of Turkey. It's okay. all part of the Med, but it's that they 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 love to break it up. Like today, we've got the Indian Ocean. Mm-hmm. Well, when I grew up, it was the Atlantic and Pacific, uh, but now we've got the Indian Ocean, which is part of the Pacific Ocean in our big terminology. The waters of the Gulf of Suez. We call it the Gulf of Suez, but it's just the Pacific waters that go up into that area. So the Aegean Sea was the the part of the Med between Greece and Turkey. And in the Aegean Sea are all these islands, uh, which Crete is one of the largest, is the largest, and it's the southernmost of the Aegean world. And the Aegean world was populated by the Greeks. And there's two basic groups that we talk about, the Mycenaean Greeks that's a modern terminology we use for them because of the excavation at Mycenae on the Greek mainland. And so they become a representative, a type site of the, of the ancient Greek culture on the mainland. And then at Crete, on Crete, 
in 1900, a guy named Arthur Evans, an archaeologist, uh, found this incredible civilization, a massive palace of 28 acres. And it was clearly a Greek style type civilization, but it was a bit different from what was in Mycenae. And so he just called this culture Minoan, and he named it after the legendary king, Greek king, Minos. And Minos had his buddy, the Minotaur, in the labyrinth beneath his palace. You know, that's all that Greek, Greek legend stuff. And so the Minoans are Greeks in the islands and particularly centered on Crete. And the Mycenaeans are Greeks on the mainland, but they're all Greeks and they're all seafaring people. And that's how they made their living with trade and conquest, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the world that the Philistines came from. So if the Philistines were, at that time, kind of seafaring, were there any famous naval battles, or did they kind of attack anyone in the region, like Egypt or anything? Um, we don't have any historical records of, of such. Crete actually did not have any fortification walls, because the, the sea was sort of their defenses. And there weren't that many people showing up, and they were wealthy from trade, and so they were among the best seamen, and they were seemed to have had a reputation of being good fighters. So they could come and go as they wished, and probably could pretty much do what they wanted as far as relating to the sea world. And uh, we have no record that they went into different ports and messed everybody up in those early days. Later on, around 1200, when the world changed, uh, you're, you're familiar with the story with Homer's uh, The Iliad and the Odyssey. The, the soldiers, the sage, sailors and soldiers of the Iliad, the good guys in the Iliad story, are actually at the same time, around 1200 BC, they're the same time and they're the same people that are the Philistines, the bad boys of the Bible. Wow. The good guys of the <laughs> Iliad and the Odyssey are the bad boys of the Bible. <laughs> and I, I got I had in my notes here because I was listening to another thing that you did. Was there a a battle with uh, during the time of Ramses? Uh, yes, Ramses the third, and that battle takes place about eleven seventy seven, and this was a time of great upheaval all over the uh, certainly the uh, Eastern Mediterranean world, and um, we don't know what happened. But that's the time that we think that's the same time that the Philistines wind up on the Canaanite coast. We don't know if it was after, it, it could have been one wave, one group of them that wound up in Canaan, the other group wound up in the Nile Delta and fought with Ramses III, or they fought with Ramses III, they did not win, uh, at, at the best it was a draw, and they wind up just moving up the coast. We don't know how those two go together, but we do know that the Philistines attacked the sea people, among whom were the Philistines, to the best of our understanding. The sea people attacked Egypt and the Canaanite coast, the southern Levant coast. So, uh, Gary, in, in conjunction with that, the broader picture of the Bronze Age at that time, 1200, what we call it, that goes into the— uh, Iron One, yeah. Yeah, into the Iron One period. Uh, there's like a lot of upheaval, we seem to think, that took place, abandonment of cities— uh, droughts and famine, that kind of stuff. Talk about that a little bit, because because that's sort of the context, the broader context of the Philistine landing on the coast. I I find that interesting. Is it chicken or egg? Is does one relate to the other? What What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, you're right. It is interesting, and it is still considered a mystery by by scholars. I mean, everybody's got an opinion, but we just don't have a solid answer. There probably was a climatic change in some significant regions that caused some people to move. And this is the Eastern Mediterranean, so a lot of these are seafaring people, or if they weren't, they became seafaring people. And so they're, they're moving all over the place. And I think a lot of the destructions in Western Anatolia, like the city of Troy, were caused by these Greek soldiers, mercenaries, sailors, these military people moving from place to place, they had to leave their area or chose to leave their area for some reason. 
and they went all over the place. That seems to be as good of an explanation for a lot of it as anything else. And so they're the guys, part of their movement. We, we, you know, the, the story of, of, um, of Troy <laughs> just, lost his, not, just lost his name. Who's the guy credited with the Trojan horse? I just lost his name. Odysseus. Yes. You know, the Odyssey is actually named after Odysseus. And after they defeated Troy, they sailed home. What should have been about a three-month voyage took them 14 years. And they wound up in all kinds of places doing all kinds of stuff to and with all kinds of people. And it just seems to be an example, an illustration of what was going on during that time period. And so we think there was a lot of movement along the coasts by Aegean people and others who joined in. And that's how all this mix came about. And, and that happened, to, uh, we dated around 1200, the very time we see this fizzle, Philistine culture on the southern Canaan coast. And it's the very time that Ramses III fights with those dudes in the uh, Nile River Delta. Hmm. So once they start kind of landing on the coast, do they start, the Philistines, do they start building cities? Do we have are there cities associated with the Philistines kind of at this time and then later on as it turns into where who's living there when the Israelites are coming in? All right. Uh, so do you remember the, um, uh, the, the number of, of important Philistine cities? The Philistines were said to have a, a group of cities that seemed to be their capitals of different groups or whatever. Are you familiar with that pentapolis of the Philistine cities? Sure. Sure. Now, see, on our TV show, Gary, you quizzed us on this, and uh, Scott and Lancer and I stumbled uh, over a couple of the answers, which we shouldn't have. So <laughs> I'm fully prepared because I have a uh, a memorization device. Age A A G G E. Okay. Excellent. So how Excellent. you like that? So, but I'll let you uh, I'll let you follow that uh, mnemonic and tell the audience what that what those cities are. Okay. So. Uh, so one of them is well known in the news today, Gaza, mm. and then Gat or Goth, Gath, and then Ekron, and, and then the uh, two A's are Ashdod and Ashkelon. Now, Gaza and um, Ashdod are really on the um, Via Maris going from north to south, and uh, Ashkelon is, is the only one that's a true seaport. And then uh, Gat and Ekron are farther inland. The uh, Philistines didn't seem to be interested at, in the Bible world. It doesn't seem that they're interested in moving into the central mountains. Uh, they're sea people. That, that's, that was still part of their world. I'm sure there was quite a bit of contact for them still back into the Aegean. But they didn't seem to be bent on conquest of the land of Canaan. They just carved out a, a, a community from Gaza in the south all the way up to the area of Joppa. They had a, a Philistine city that we call today Tel Kassila. And so they had those four main cities and then took the southern Canaan coast. Ekron is just at the edge of the Shvela, the, the Israeli foothills. And uh, that was as far east as they went as far as settling. But they sent teams, they, they fought all along in, that, in the central hills. But they, um, they, they didn't seem to be interested in conquering the region, just carving out their own community, which they did pretty well. And I think in some context, well, we, we see Israelites it, it, with, with Samson, we see Israelites and Philistines existing with each other. And I think Philistines and Canaanites did the same. So when I think of the, the time of the conquest, when Joshua and the Israelites were coming in, Weren't they commanded to wipe everyone out? But it seems like the Philistines were still there for hundreds of years. So Very, very good, because the, there are seven nations of Canaan that are mentioned that are Canaanites of the land, okay. natives of the land. They were to be wiped out. The Philistines were never considered one of those seven nations of Canaan. And in fact, with our Bible chronology, the, Philist the uh, Israelites show up in 1400 B.C., the Philistines in mass don't show up till after 1200 BC. Oh, okay. And that coastal area 
the, the Israelites never really got any kind of control of the coastal area till after the days of David, after 1000 BC. So the Philistines were there for a couple of hundred years uh, running, running the show. Now, th this sort of can relate later when we talk about Philistines and Palestinians, if we continue that part. But at Ashkelon, one of those five cities of the Philistine Pentapolis, at Ashkelon, they had a, found a cemetery of, of people that lived during that time period. And what they found was from the time of uh, the Philistine, uh, the, the big time of the Philistines, beginning in uh, uh, about uh, 1150 down to, um, I think, well, the, the cemetery went down to about 700 uh, BC. And this, but this was still would have been a major Philistine city, well known as a Philistine city even to those days. The, the graves before the Philistines showed up had had minimal, very, very, very minimal Aegean DNA. During the time of the Philistines, they had uh, the highest level of DNA. And then after the time of the Philistines, after about, um, after the 700s BC, there was almost no D uh, Aegean DNA. So the Philistines quickly assimilated, well, within a couple hundred years, assimilated with the local population, which would have been mostly Canaanite and, you know, some other. So the DNA actually supported the Philistines living on the coast, but they uh, acclimated, uh, assimilated with the local population within a few hundred years. Uh, your description, Gary, too, that, by the way, that's one of the benefits now of archaeology. You know, in the past, we had the pottery analysis, which would yes. help us. Now we have DNA analysis, which complements yes. that. So it's really just helps us to understand occupations. Because when you find a skeleton, you don't know as much as you can know now because of, you know, modern technology. Yes. But Absolutely. maybe the person who's listening is thinking, wait a minute, I thought the Israelites were supposed to take over the whole land. You know, I know you know the answer to this, but but for someone who's hearing that for the first time, there's some nuance to what takes place in this period. Could you explain that a little bit? Yeah, and I'm and I'm gonna offer a take that may be extra nuanced, even even for your guys' take. The Bible gives us there's half a dozen references where God says basically you have from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River, from the river of Egypt which is not the Nile, it makes sense to me that it would be, but it's not. There's a, there's a, a, a river, the Wadi El Arish, that's um, uh, south of Gaza, not too far south, but south of Gaza. It's right along the modern border area uh, between Israel and Egypt. But from the Wadi, uh, from the, um, the river of Egypt, Wadi El Arish, up to the Mediterranean. So east and west, Jordan River, Med, Wadi El Arish, at the southern end of modern Israel, up to the Euphrates. That's what God promised them and said, it's yours. But then we read in Joshua and the beginning of the book of Judges, the Israelites didn't do it. You know, now, you know, who does that sound like? You know, <laughs> sounds like me, you know, all the, all the opportunities and, and possibilities God gives me and I poop around and mess around and, can you say poop on the podcast? <laughs> we'll, we'll bleep it out if we need to. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so, you know, I just mess around and I sometimes I never get around to all that God would have had for me to do. When I get to heaven, I'll go, well, sometimes I know it even here and now, but then I go, oh man, I wish, you know, why didn't I do that? Why didn't I try harder? Why didn't I stay focused? Whatever. So the Israelites didn't do that. And Henry, I, I think um, because of the uh, Amarna letters, I've been, working through the Amarna letters. And I'm convinced that the Amarna letters do not have the Israelites engaging anybody farther north than Sidon or Damascus. And so I don't think the Israelites got even close to half of the land God had promised them. And in fact, I said Damascus, not even past Mount Hermon, which is south of Damascus. From, from Sidon to Mount Hermon, there's no indication the Israelites went any farther than that and, and engaged at all, let alone occupied. Right. 
and they they didn't do the coast. And then Joshua and Judges are full of references. They didn't conquer the coast. So they they only did a halfway job of what God had promised them. They got less than half. Now, the Bible does say that in David's day, he actually got all that. In David's day, they actually got up to the Euphrates. Now, right. they didn't really occupy, but they did conquer yeah. nations, groups. Yeah, it's interesting. The text where God says to Joshua and the Israelites, see or look, I, I have given you this land. It's yours, as you said, and it's their inheritance. But then, you know, it's kind of like uh, getting uh, a, a bequeathed a million dollars, but never going to the lawyer to sign the paperwork to collect it, right? <laughs> you know, it's yours legally, but if you don't go appropriate it, then you never possess it in the technical sense. So it's kind of interesting. You, you know, I was thinking about that that analogy a little bit. So that's good, Gary. It's very helpful. And we have evidence of the Philistines on the coast. The Egyptians had garrisons on the coast Yes. Uh, also. So we had Egyptians, we had Canaanites, we had Philistines because everybody wanted control of that coastal plain because of the trade route. You mentioned, uh, you alluded to the Via Maris earlier. Yes. Yeah. If you, if you wouldn't mind, could you kind of give us some of maybe the, what are some of the major stories of the Bible that reference the Philistines, like like from the Judges, Book of Judges, and from the Book of Samuel, what are like maybe the top three or four instances where there were confrontations with the Philistines? Well, probably our um, the big biggest Philistine story in the Book of Judges would be Samson. Okay, and he's living there right on that fringe territory. He, he's living on the western edge of the Israelite uh, camps, cities villages and uh, right on the edge where he's walking in to see Philistines they interact on a regular basis I suppose you could probably make some sort of a the Protestants and the uh, Catholics in in Ireland uh, over the centuries even Palestinians and Israelis today uh, they intermingle they mix they may be friends they may not be but they've learned to coexist with each other so in, in Samson's day, at his place, that was the case. Now, it'd be easy for one to set the other off. And Samson, they did that to each other regularly in the, the Samson cycles of, of stories. So that's really the big one in, in the book of Judges. Then in, um, in 1 Samuel, of course, I think the big one is, is the, uh, the loss of the Ark of the Covenant. Eli is the high priest uh, in Israel at Shiloh. And the Israelites are going to go to battle against the Philistines. And, of course, they take the ark from Shiloh. No real sense of why God would have them do that. So we think, once again, operating without the benefit of of God's insights, uh, which we have all been known to do, they did that. They lost the battle. They lost the ark. And, of course, the ark goes to three of the Philistine cities, three of those Philistine cities, one of them being Ekron, another one of them, Gat, the, the, take, the ark is taken to their, their God's temple, and in each place, uh, there's disaster in the city and destruction in the temple with the Ark of the Covenant just quietly sitting there. And so that's, a, that's one of the great stories. And then I think probably the third really good one is David and Goliath. And uh, we, we have Goliath probably standing about nine foot six, if we take the the Bible, the the biblical text literally. Now, the the Masoretic text puts him at about six foot six. Uh, Excuse me, the the Septuagint, the Masoretic text has him at nine six, the Septuagint at six foot six. So, you know, he's he's a big boy. If if Goliath at nine six, he could play on anybody's basketball team and he wouldn't have to jump to dunk the ball. But, you know, he's not a giant like 20 feet tall. It's not something that's unbelievable. Um, in fact, the tallest man on record, human record today, was uh, was seven nine. Robert Warrell, a uh, Wardell, I guess is how you say it, um, an American, and, and yeah, uh, he's eight so, foot you know, eleven, I think. It, uh, eight foot eleven. Okay, yes, that's right. You're right. That, yeah, the, the basketball players are seven nine. Yeah, so eight foot eleven. That's right. So he's not at all outside the Goliath of of the, the Bible. Is not at all outside the the range of what's possible. So that though I think those are probably the three greatest stories, at least in my mind, Samson, 
And Goliath was from Goth, Ar- right? Wasn't that like one of the big five? Yeah, one of the big five. So is there any reference to Goliath or anything in that city? Because if he was kind of a major deal, um, or is that name mentioned in any kind of archaeology and anything? You know, there, there, actually, there actually was a piece of broken pottery. We call it a sherd. The British call it shards, but I rebuke our diggers when they refer to our pottery as shards. That's the Brits. <laughs> you know, you know they, we, so we don't do that. No. So we are shards. So a broken shard that you write on is called an ostracon. It's, it's, it's something, it's, it's, a, it's a broken piece of pottery that you turn into a post-it note. Uh, that you would not so much post, but you would write on. It's an ostracon, and there was an ostracon found at the site of Gat that that actually has a name that really could be translated Goliath. Now we don't think it's our boy. In fact, it's it's a little later than our boy, but there we got we got a Goliath name in a Goliath city. That ought to count for something to suggest that there's a historical basis behind the biblical text. Yeah, it's interesting, Gary. If I remember reading correctly about that, the name is somewhat unusual. So to find yes. a, to find an yes, ostracon yes. with the name yes. would would sort of correlate nicely with the biblical text. In other words, you know, the biblical author is in that context historically is what that kind of idea points to. So, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Good. I forgot to say that. Yeah, it's a reasonable inference from the evidence. I yes. think is the way we could say it. Yes, absolutely right. Yeah. Now, uh, when you mentioned Samson, the temple, uh, how do you pronounce that? Tel Kassil? Uh, Kassila. Kassila. Tel now, that's, Kassila. That, that's up near Joppa. Am I right about that? Did you mention that earlier? Yes. Uh, so there's a bit of, now that's a Philistine temple that's been discovered there, right? And yes. if I remember right, from the right time period, right time, right place. Tell tell us a little about yes. a, a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, now it's it's not nearly as large as so we we got we got um, uh, Samson killing at a Philistine temple and on his death he uh, kills more Philistines than he did in his life and I believe the number it's in the thousands if it's two or three or six thousand Philistines that it says he slew in pulling down that temple. The, the temple at Kassila is way smaller than that. Okay. He, you know, people standing on the roof, whatever, way smaller. But still, it had two pillars as its basis in the center. And the pillars were close enough that somebody could actually deal with both of them, maybe not with their hands, but at least with a rope or a chain or something. Could could actually wrap around both of those and take them both down. Uh, and these these were wooden pillars. Well, that's our understanding based on what we found. We assume they were wooden pillars at the temple in Tel Kassila. So it's it's not what it would not have been the size of what there might have been in the Samson story, but that same outline of floor plan of a temple where he could get a hold of two pillars and tear it down. Uh, we find that that being the case at Tel Kassila. Yeah. So, so again, not necessarily the temple, but it fits in the right spot it, it, uh, in the sense of uh, uh, the general context, I guess, is what you're getting at. Yes. That's good stuff. I was wondering if I could switch gears and go backwards a little bit sure. about, a, about a couple archaeology questions related to the Philistines. If yeah. you know, the first one would be, we can infer from the capture of the ark in Samuel, the Bible doesn't say that Shiloh was destroyed, but that's a reasonable inference. Could you talk about a little bit about the evidence that we've uncovered at Shiloh at our excavation? So this is our own original field work. At least a little bit of that, if you could, make, make those connections, if you could. Yeah, and I, as I was running through that story, I, I thought, and I moved on, but yes, thank you. I should have said that. So Henry and I have excavated in Shiloh, the, what would we, we think was the first capital of Israel, because that's where the, the um, high priest was, and the tabernacle, and the temple, and Joshua. So we, it really was the first capital of Israel, and it was that way for, oh, 350 years or so. And uh, well, at least until the ark <laughs> disappeared. And so when they took the ark in, in, away into battle, uh, that, that Bible's 
that story's in the Bible. And then the Bible doesn't say that the Philistines then went on to Shiloh and destroyed the city. But that's been often suggested and is a reasonable uh, thought. But there was no archaeological evidence till the Associates for Biblical Research excavated the northern slope of the Tell. And there, inside the, the uh, Bronze Age city wall, which I am sure the Israelites used to some degree, you got this massive city wall standing. You're going to, there's at least, at the very least, a foundation. Not that it was standing, but there's a foundation there. You're going to put some walls up. Add, add a little bit to it and use it for walls. And inside that wall area, we found some um, floors in some rooms. And on the floor, there was burnt destruction. And we, we've dated, carbon dated it and pottery dated it to the uh, around 1100, a little before 1100 BC, which would fit a, a destruction, a burning of the city at the at the roughly at the time of Samuel, the the time of um, of the Philistines being in the area, the time of that the ark was lost. So we we have a, a burnt destruction layer there that seems to fit the time frame. So as you've used the the idea of of, of a reasonable possibility, uh, it's it's a reasonable thing to say that the Philistines may well have come, and if they did. This is probably that destruction. Yeah, it's, that's a good summary, Gary. I remember when we did the carbon-14 testing on the uh, re- remains there, uh, Dr. Stripling sent an email out for all us to try to, yes. okay, give us a guess of what date it's going to come back. And the person who uh, got the closest date, I believe, got a free ice cream bar when we were in Israel. But that was kind of fun, though. But it was good, you know, after we got the scientific testing back. Yes. It kind of validated uh, or... or gave more credence to our hypothesis. Maybe I should say it that way. Yes. So that's very helpful. Now, the other thing I wanted to ask a big picture, uh, we mentioned briefly the distinct Philistine culture in, in the cities on the coast, generally speaking, what do we see in the pottery? Just broadly speaking, uh, differences between Israelite Canaanite and uh, how different is the pottery? Yes, the the, uh, the pottery is quite different. It is clearly has an Aegean motif. Many of the forms are Aegean, and then the the painted motifs on the outside are very much Aegean. But we we we've done neutron activation analysis studies of the clay in the pottery, and we found that these were not vessels that were made in the Aegean and brought over. They were locally made. So there, there's, a, there's a few that are, are from the Aegean, but the vast majority of what we call Philistine pottery, and it's, um, it's pottery that has a, uh, the outside of the, of the pottery is, is a cream or whitish color, a real light tan, or kind of whitish, that, because that's the color of, of the clay in, in the Aegean world. They tended to use a clay that was white. Well, they wanted to make it like their own, so they made pottery, they they formed the vessel out of local clay, and then they would put what we call a slip. They covered it over with something that made it look lighter and whiter, like what they knew, and then they painted on it generally red and black. It started red and black, and then later, we call that bichrome, then later, around the time of David, they went to just uh, typically black or red. And uh, they would refer to that as monochrome. And that's a little bit of, a, of an indication of, of a time difference, a couple hundred year time difference. So the Philistine pottery looked Aegean. Uh, the forms were Aegean. The decorations were Aegean. But it was locally made stuff, which, which makes, makes perfect sense. There's also a Philistine hearth kind of a deal that, was a, that we find in Philistine sites that we also used in the Aegean. So there's, there's a number of little things that seem to tell us they would, they were, this was in fact the, the Philistines, the, the, the pottery, the change in pottery and material culture, the location and the time period just perfectly fit what the Bible says, who they were, where they came from and when they arrived. It's an amazing connection. Good stuff. My last uh, question, we didn't plan to talk about this, 
But we see in the book of Judges that the tribe of Dan was once down in that, in the, like the Shephala uh, or close to the coast and they yes. move up all the way to the north and they conquer uh, Laish. Yes. Or if or La- Laish, if you pronounce it that way, I always forget. So our theory, working theory has been perhaps the Philistine invasion puts sort of amount of pressure on them to get out of Dodge. Now we don't know that from the text, but could you comment on that a little bit? Do you think that's a plausible theory? Do you have an alternative uh, thoughts on that? Is that out to lunch? T- tell us your thoughts on that. All right. Well, um, we're dating the conquest around 1400 BC. In the book of Judges, I don't. Th- I don't think the Dan story is in Joshua at all. I think that that Correct. Dan story you just referred to is only in the book of Judges. 18, 18 or nineteen, something like that. Yes. Yep. yep. So. It would be it would be right on the threshold, seemingly in the book of Judges, of the time that the Philistines were showing up. So we got 1400 BC Joshua. Uh, they they conquer the land, and then we, and then we've got the book of Judges, and and we got a couple hundred years there in the, in the book of Judges. So I, I think it's very possible that it's the Philistines. What we do know though is the Bible says, and, it's, and it's, you made kind of reference to this earlier. The Bible says it about a dozen times. The Canaanites lived on the coast and in the valleys. The coast we've been talking about where the Philistines moved in and cramped their style. The uh, Jezreel Valley, Megiddo, Beit Shan, that great big, uh, the Valley of Armageddon it's often called. And then the Jordan River Valley. The Bible puts the Canaanites in those three areas. And the Israelites hardly make any impact in that for for all the way through the book of Judges, from Joshua through Judges. It's not till David, in those areas. And the Bible puts the, the Amorites in the mountains. And that would be the mountains, of the central mountains of, of Judea, and then the, the, the Jordanian plateau. So the Bible keeps saying, about a dozen times, uh, Canaanites are in the valleys and on the coast, the Amorites are on the mountains. And so that's why Henry at, at Shiloh, Bryant got a start of Brian Wood, Dr. Bryant Wood, at, at Cribbidel McCotter, he quit calling our city wall at McCotter a Canaanite city wall because he read in the Bible that the Canaanites were in the valleys and the Amorites were in the hills. So I said, we should call that an Amorite wall. Right. So right. I, I, I said, okay, I got you. You know, I, I get it. That's what the Bible says. So, so we've changed that. So at uh, Shiloh, we try not to say Canaanite wall. We try to say Amorite wall because we think that's more Correct. So it would have been the Canaanites in the valley and maybe the incursion of the Philistines, too, that the tribe of Dan said, um, "Nah, this isn't working out for us. I know God gave this to us. And I do remember that he said he would go before us and, and win the victory. But can't we go someplace else? You know, how many of us settle for second best so often in our own lives today? And I think, you know, we're just, when we do that, we're just following the example of the tribe of Dan moving up north yeah. to the city we call the city of Dan today. Yeah, and I think if I remember right from the biblical text, you know, they attacked that city there, which was not something that God endorsed. And that was another sin that was added on top of it because there were people living there. Yes. So, you know, that's another compounding factor in there. But it is it is interesting. We don't know because the biblical text doesn't tell us that it was the Philistines and the Canaanites that pressured them. But nonetheless, it is a fascinating thing. It's not original to me, by the way. This has been published in various places at ABR over the years, Dr. Wood and yourself. But anyway, I think it's very interesting. We can we can draw reasonable inferences without being dogmatic. If you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about once the Philistines kind of have their settled there in the land, tell us a little bit about their culture there, like the gods that they worshipped. And I think I read that they're famous for their alcohol and beer production. So can you tell us just a, a little bit about what their day-to-day kind of culture was like when they're not okay. killing Israelites? <laughs> That's right. Well, um, so the Philistine houses tended to be somewhat like the local Canaanite and Israelite houses. They would have interior rows of pillars that was not uncommon. I said there's a little different kind of a of a hearth cooking arrangement where the um, the locals tended to use uh, what we call taboons or tanurs, 
to cook in and basically to bake in. Philistines tended to deal with hearths uh, more often. The Philistines had, um, they're, they're, they're famous for this strainer jug. It's a jug with one handle on one side and a strainer spout on the other. And Henry, it's an interesting thing, but you, you watch it and you'll see it. Round spouted jugs tend to be Canaanite and what we call channel spouted. So on the top, it's like an arch, but the bottom, it's flat. That's an Aegean motif. And the Philistines regularly use these channel spouts. And so you've got a, you've got a spout. You've got a, um, at the inside of the spout, you've got uh, clay, and the clay's been punctured with holes. And so whatever you're, you're pouring out of there, you're straining out something so you can pour out a liquid. And it's been long been suggested that, that was, uh, those were beer mugs for the Philistines drinking beer. Based on those beer mugs and, a, and some biblical references, the great archaeologist, American archaeologist, William Foxwell Albright, he referred to the Philistines as those mighty carousers. <laughs> and, and so, um, so we, 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 we think that now. We now have the ability, Henry, you're talking about all the science. We now have the ability to test the clay on the inside of vessels. And we can tell you, not we, that'd be the chemists who can tell us, but they can tell us what was inside that vessel. And we can now know, uh, we, could, we could, those kind of tests could be done and find if there's any, any indication that it could have been a fermented beer, any indication of wheat, uh, well, barley, they would have made their beer out of barley. So that could really settle that answer uh, once and for all, how mightily they were carousing around. But they they quickly, uh, archaeologists are surprised how quickly they assimilated, coming in so different within just a couple hundred years, they were much more like the locals. And then it got to the place where you might have a the plaque that says potty, the king of Ekron, who we know was a Philistine king, we may have the plaque that says he's a Philistine. Everything about the way he lives looks Canaanite, looks like the local people, which would have been some Canaanites, some Israelites in those days. So um, they quickly assimilated, but they clearly came in with, with a different culture. And of course, the Bible suggests that they had metal abilities with metal way before the Israelites or, or much greater than the Israelites. And one of those metals would have been iron. And of course, we're, they, they would have been at the forefront of, of using iron in the Iron Age. I, I, I went through the biblical text on that recently, and it doesn't say that there are no Israelites that could do it, but they weren't doing it. So they were either doing stuff in hiding or, you know, just put away all their stuff, but because of the Philistine uh, influence and impact on, on their world, sort of like in a Nazi the Nazi, uh, a country that's occupied by the Nazis, you have the ability and the knowledge to do it, but you don't dare do it. If you're doing it, you do it in secret. And boy, if you get caught, you're dead. Yeah. And that, that yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah, I think that's that's all really interesting. Uh, one last thing, if you wouldn't mind just talking about when they were assimilating Canaanite culture or the other cultures around them, did that mean assimilating their gods? Yes. The um, Dagon... The temple of Dagon, where the Ark of the Covenant was taken by the Philistines, that's a Canaanite god. Okay. And so um, it is amazing. I, I was just reading about the Mycenaeans just yesterday when I was preparing for today. When, when the Mycenaeans conquered the Minoans, the Mycenaeans adopted Minoan culture. It's just amazing. When the Greeks, when, when Alexander the Great conquered Babylon, he, he picked up, adopted Babylonian dress. It, it's it's an amazing you, you defeat an enemy so you're the victor you're the conqueror but you are fascinated with their culture and their world and it seemed like the uh, philistines very quickly maybe it was all, all the all the canaanite girls i don't know but they very quickly gave in and and began to become much more like the canaanites than they were aegeans just a few years earlier. So Gary, uh, the, the Canaanites bewitched the Philistines much like they did the Israelites, huh? No wonder God, really? no wonder God told them to uh, get rid of them. And of course they disobeyed. So, so you mentioned uh, cultural appropriation too, I guess uh, uh, modern um, uh, 
certain uh, worldview perspectives would be very offended by uh, Alexander's appropriation of, of Babylonian culture, huh? How about that? That's <laughs> but that that's a topic for another episode. <laughs> oh yeah, sure is. Isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So the Philistines keep going. They're around for hundreds of years. They get pushed back during the time of David, but they still have a land that's referred to as the land of the Philistines on down through Hezekiah's time and in the prophets of the Old Testament. Gary, have you ever excavated at any of these Philistine cities? I did excavate at Akron. And um, I excavated in the, in the level where the early Philistines were showing up, Canaanite city first and then Philistines. And um, after I, I finished digging there, they later found a plaque uh, on a temple there in Ekron that named the king who we know from history. So we already knew his name from history, but the plaque said this was dedicated to, um, and I forget the Canaanite god, the, the, uh, god. It was at this point they were really assimilated. It's more of a Canaanite god than a, a gene god, but whoever it was, and uh, his, his name was Potty, P-O-D-I, Potty, king of Ekron. Is that right? And so they were there, they assimilated, but that was all that was all the, the land of the Philistines all the way through the Old Testament that was continually referred to. Hmm. Are there any references to the Philistines outside the Bible? Yes. Herodotus. So Herodotus was a Greek historian of the um, fifth century. He was actually sort of the, the first true historian in the Western world kind of mind where he put together uh, people, places, and events, and causes of events, cause and effect stuff. He uh, he was a he really was the first true historian. Although I think the biblical writers actually did the same kind of thing, and they don't really get credit for that. But he was a, a, a true historian. He was Greek, writing in Greek, and he wrote a lot about the Greeks and the Persians, the war, the wars, the Battle of Thermopylae, the Battle of Marathon where King Xerxes of, Ex, of, the, of the book of Esther uh, is trying to take over Greece and he's avenging his father's earlier loss at Marathon. Uh, and so, so he, he writes about all, all of that stuff. Herodotus's book, The Histories, uh, in seven different vo- parts, The Histories is a, is a series of volumes and book one, two, three, and seven, he mentions six times the Philist, the land of the Philistines. So now that we're the fifth century where, you know, um, there would actually be some people with some Philistine DNA still around in that region. And so he knew of the region called the land of the Philistines, not big references, indications, but it, he seemed to understand it was along the coast. So it, we, we've got Herodotus referring to the same land of the Philistines that the Bible did along the coast. So this just all fits together really nicely. And most scholars, no, I don't think anybody has a problem. No scholars trying to explain that away. Yes, he's talking about the same region that the Philistines settled in the book of Joshua and, and, and Judges. Okay, so that takes us through the Greek period. I guess at some point here after this, we're going to start finding references to Palestine. We started with that question way in the beginning here, but maybe you could tell us what happens next. So. Uh, we've got that name, the land of the Philistines, still being used in Herodotus' day. Now, that term gets used all the way down through the Roman period. Now, the word Palestine is used throughout this period from the times of the Greeks all the way down through the Romans. It's used in the region. Now, we, we won't say it's necessarily on the Philistine coast, but it's just used for that general region. In fact, it was also, it was sometimes referred to as Syria and Palestine together, not like we would use the modern term Syro-Palestine. So uh, that word Palestine was in use by the Romans, but there was a Roman province called Judea that rebelled against the Romans twice in 50 years and uh, caused a great deal of consternation to the empire This backwater community of unsophisticated Easterners really did mess with the Roman army in in some amazing ways. And so the first Jewish revolt was, of course, 70 AD, when the temple 
was destroyed. And the second Jewish revolt ending in 135 AD, and that's when um, when Jews were, were really banned from the whole region. And, and the first one, the first one took place under Emperor Vespasian and his son Titus. The second one took place under Emperor Hadrian. And between Vespasian and Titus, between them and Emperor um, Hadrian, there was very limited Jewish connection with Jerusalem. They had been dispersed, not uh, carried away, moved away, but just decimated in war and either lay in low or wandered off into other regions, including Egypt. And so uh, the word Palestinian was used, Palestine was used for the region. People weren't called Palestinians, but they, were, they, they used the name Palestine for the region. But after the uh, destruction of the temple, Judea was no more much of anything. Although they did, they did, have, a, they did have a governor. They did have a governor of the region of Judea. But after Hadrian, 132, 135 B.C., there was no longer a province of Judea. So Hadrian didn't resurrect a new term, Palestine. He was using a term that was well known, used in the region, but he just no longer, he, he erased Judea. So in that sense, he kind of erased the, the Jews. But in another sense, he was just renaming something that was already used and known for the region. So it, it wasn't quite the thing that, that I've been taught that he, it was anti-Jewish. There was nothing Jewish left. They so decimated the Jewish community and the Jewish cities. There was really nothing left. And so Hadrian actually took, in 135, he was re, uh, repopulating what used to be Jerusalem that he renamed Alia Capitolina, and that would have to do with the, the, the uh, Hadrian's family name, and the Capitolina was a, a Roman god. So uh, he renamed the city and was making it Western-style city, uh, and it was going to be a homeland, a retirement village for the 10th Roman Legion, who had spent so much time fighting Jews in that area for hundreds of years, for, for dozens of years. So it, uh, that's where Judea no longer exists from the days of Hadrian on. And it, it, is, it is known by the name Palestine from that point on. That's a great historical lesson, Gary. I, I had the same understanding that you, that you mentioned earlier, that, that the uh, Romans took the name as a pejorative and renamed the land that from the word Philistine. Yeah. And what you're saying is hey, we're not denying that the, uh, the Romans were anti-Semites. They most certainly were. Uh, yes. It's just that they didn't invent the term per se. Yes. They were anti-Semitic in a number of different ways by murdering the Jews, yes. by erasing the term Judea and that sort of thing. So that's very helpful. We want to make sure that uh, this is a great lesson for us, I think. It is for me. How many things do we hear that we really think are right? And we kind of absorb them by osmosis. But then sometimes when we dig into them, we find out, eh, that's not quite the story. There's more nuance to it. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. And I think this exercise is a very good one. So that's a great job. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're welcome. So so we, we've got that name going from the, the late Roman period. Of course, the, the, the city, Jerusalem, was called Alia Capitolina for quite a while. In fact, that term was used until the Muslim invasion in uh, 630. It was known by that term. The Muslims uh, changed the name shortly to El Quds, uh, the Holy, although they would use the word Jerusalem some a little bit, but El Quds. And then when the, uh, the Crusaders came, they, went, they used the word Jerusalem. The Crusaders went back to a little more of a biblical terminology, but that name Palestine for the region stuck. But people really didn't call themselves Palestinians. So we, we, get, we get down to um, the 20th century, and we've got the Balfour Declaration. Lord Balfour of the British Foreign, Foreign Office made a promise that the British 
would look favorably on a national homeland for the Jews. And he uses the word in Palestine. And that was so, in 1917? 1917. So, so then in 1922, after World War, and that, this is during 1970, during World War I. Mm-hmm. In 1922, after World War I, the League of Nations is formed, the forerunner of the United Nations. And the League of Nations creates what they call the British Mandate for Palestine. And they refer to the region, and Palestine was part of the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Ottoman Empire. And that was for like 500 years. And so then, after the war, all of this land was up for grabs. The Brits were given mandate control over Egypt. They were given mandate control over what was called Palestine, which went from the Med to um, well up past the, on the Jordan Plateau, w- way far out. And, and then um, the French got uh, Lebanon. So, But anyway, Palestine was on both sides of the Jordan River, and the British had mandate control. And then they broke off the east side fairly early. And I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the date, but it was the late 20s, or early 30s. They broke off the country of Jordan. They initially called it Transjordan. Trans meaning the other side of Jordan versus Cisjordan, which means this side of Jordan. And so the west was Cisjordan, the east was Transjordan. And they broke that off into a, another, a new nation, one of the first new nations that were conceived after the British, after the uh, World War I. Uh, you know, Egypt declared its independence somewhat later. And it was designed to be a Muslim Arab country. And then the other side of the Jordan, the West Bank part, was going to be, um, well, they, they, they left it open for Muslims, Jews, Christians, Palestinians, Arabs, and, and Israelis. All of them could be on the West side, but it was now on the East side of the Jordan. That was the new country of Jordan. And of course, in 1948, that new country of Jordan annexed, when Israel declared itself a nation, they annexed what we call the West Bank today. But it wasn't really until this 20th century that people began to call themselves Palestinians. A Palestinian today is an Arab who lives or originated from Palestine. Now, the word Arab, it's a people group They traditionally relate themselves back to Ishmael, Abraham's son. There's not a a clear historical basis, but that's a traditional basis. And it's not popular to even challenge that in the modern world. You don't want to be, you don't want to get in, get their ire up. So that's, you know, that's just one of the historical things that we say is is true. But the word Arab actually, actually comes from the Hebrew word Arabah or Aravah which is one of the words for desert in the Bible, a desert kind of region. So the Arabs were the desert dwellers in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, the Arabian desert. That's what an Arab was. And so even today, Egyptians, I've I've referred to an Egyptian as being Arab, and they, they correct me. No, no, I'm not an Arab. I'm an Egyptian. Lebanese. Uh, you call them an Arab and they'll, they will correct you and say, no, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm Lebanese. And some of them who know the Bible will say, actually, I, actually the, the Lebanese, we are descendants of the original Canaanites. And historians think that's probably true. But we, we believe that the, the Lebanese were the Phoenicians and the Phoenicians were the northern Canaanites. So, of course, all kinds of intermarriage, we understand that, but that's probably the truth. So an Arab is from one of the tribes of the uh, Saudi Arabian Peninsula, they would be ones, Arabs, who live or originated in Palestine. Has nothing to do with Philistines. Frankly, really has nothing to do with Canaanites. They're a whole different people group from all that we know and understand. That was a tour de force, Gary. It's very helpful. I think it's important just making sure we get those historical details right especially when we're dealing with the modern controversies, you know, making sure that we're talking correctly about the history and the background and the terminology and all that other kind of thing. So I thought that was 
really important. Just so much great stuff from history that is so supportive, or it's it's a reasonable connection to the Bible. Henry, you know, I'm of the mindset. I'm not really trying to prove anything to anybody. Here's what it says. Here's what I think it means. Here's how I think we can apply it to our lives and history. And uh, I just think if you're at all reasonable, you can say, yeah, that, that could be. At the very least, if not flat out, that makes sense. So I, I, I think we just, the Bible is just full of it. And the, the Philistine deal is, I think, just a great example of all that. Amen. Well, you guys, this has really been been fun. Thank, thank you. And I'm, you're welcome. of course, getting to talk about the Bible and all this historical stuff is just, it's, it's exciting for me. And I'm really glad to do this with you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. I loved it. All right. Love you, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. Ditto. Thanks, guys. Blessings. Well, that was a whole bunch of info. And thanks for sticking around today. That's all we have for today. So until next time. Digging for Truth is a presentation of the Associates for Biblical Research. To find out more about ABR, just go to BibleArchaeology.org.